Hello, everyone. I'm Sean O'Kernin. I'm a former student of European politics at uh, Birkbeck College and, in fact, a former student of Dionysis Dimitrakopoulos, uh, the Jean, Jean Monnet Chair in Parliamentary Democracy and European Integration at the Department of Politics of Birkbeck. And I'm delighted from time to time to contribute to the Talking Europe channel. I am uh, as I say, Sean O'Kernin, Secretary General of the Renew Europe Group in the European Committee of the Regions. And I'm joined by Andre Lauter, who is um, a political advisor in the Renew Europe team, uh, specifically dealing with um, a number of issues, in particular the one that we're going to talk about today, which is uh, trade and the role of subnational government in the European Union's trade policy. Um, before we invite uh, Andre to, to tell us some more about, uh, about his work, I'd like to take us back to 2016. And I'm gonna read some extracts from some news articles of the time. This one is from uh, Deutsche Welle, the German public broadcaster in the English uh, language, uh, from their English language uh, website. And it's an opinion article. And the headline uh, says, the EU's Walloon CETA disaster. So CETA here is C-E-T-A. It's the trade agreement that was uh, agreed at the time with Canada. And Walloon is referring to the region of Belgium, uh, the southern region of Belgium called Wallonia. And so the headline is the EU's Walloon CETA disaster. And I'm gonna read a couple of extracts from this. It says, it is an extraordinary political spectacle, a region that makes up only 0.7% of the European Union population is holding the rest of the half a billion people in the bloc host hostage. On the first day of the EU summit in Brussels, the Walloon Prime Minister, Paul Magnette, raised hopes of overcoming the gridlock through further talks. Frantic overnight negotiations were conducted with no success. Um, this farce, it carries on, it says, this farce also reflects domestic politics in Belgium. And we'll come to that later. A huge disaster for the EU. Haggling with Wallonia has proved to be a political disaster for the EU. The largest trade bloc in the world has allowed itself to be made a fool of. The EU will face disgrace if the impasse is not solved in the next few days. Who will want to negotiate a trade agreement with Europe in the future if any region can throw a spanner in the works? The worst part of all is that the EU has become the subject of international scorn and derision. If the bloc no longer has the capacity to conduct trade, one of its main strengths, then Brussels might as well close up shop. So that's one article that appeared uh, at the time when it came as a shock to a lot of people to know that a region could block um, the implementation the, the approval of a massive trade deal negotiated by the European Union. Here's another article, an opinion article in Euractiv. Euractiv is a news website specializing on EU affairs. And this is also from October, 2016. The headline is CETA, Wallonia and Sovereignty in Europe. A couple of extracts. The chaos that followed Wallonia's refusal to ratify CETA exposed Europe's inability to reflect on the question of sovereignty and where it really resides. According to the treaties of the EU, free trade agreements fall under the common EU commercial policy. This means that the European Commission has been conferred the competence to negotiate such agreements directly with the EU's trade partners under the supervision of the Council. With the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty in 2009, the European Parliament gained the power to ratify or reject such treaties. Yet against the background of Brexit, 
the member states managed to make the European Commission concede that CETA was not a classic trade agreement, but a mixed agreement, which falls under both national and EU competence. Hence, the deal required the approval of all national parliaments, as well as regional parliaments in certain federal states. This explains why in Belgium, Wallonia was in a position to block the ratification process. From a democratic point of view, this return to national and subnational parliamentary sovereignty could be welcomed, but the reality is not so simple. So fast forward now to 2020 and 2021, and Andre and I want to bring you up to date with what has been happening in the area of trade uh, and the trade policy of the European Union. So um, I'd like to ask you, Andre, to tell us why is the Committee of the Regions, where we work, um, dealing with trade? So in a way, your uh, few uh, articles that talk about Wallonian, well, rejection of CETA agreement, uh, which by the way, still hasn't been ratified by Wallonia, but um, uh, only provisionally um, explain, but uh, don't perhaps fully, fully, fully uh, account for everything that has happened in between. Um, the Committee of the Region, the, the European Committee of the Regions is the representative of the subnational authorities. So Wallonia as a, as a Belgian region would have been represented in the COR and is. And as a representative of, of, of regions that have uh, now, as you mentioned, uh, competence to ratify trade agreements. Um, so one uh, answer to your question is clearly um, not, um, not all the regions, but the regions will have in the future, if we're talking about mixed agreements, if we're talking about these ambitious uh, comprehensive agreements that also have an investment dimension, and this is the key here, because we're talking about opening markets also to investment in, for example, public amenities, which are mostly competence of local and regional authorities. Um, it's a question of competence. So the Committee of the Regions is dealing with the trade because trade has become also subnational competence in one end. The other part of the reason is that we are increasingly aware we have been aware, but we are increasingly recognizing it at the highest political levels that trade has uh, unequal effects regionally, territorially. So in, in strict ter trade terms, we can talk about winners or losers, but in, in, the re in our terms, in the Committee of the Regions, we like to talk about cohesion. We talk a lot about cohesion. And if we have, tra uh, if we have regions that don't have the same mix of industries, that don't have the same level of diversification, diversification of their economies or the same level of specialization, or uh, they're not as innovative as some other regions. Obviously the effects of trade agreements which can cover several sectors, but not all of them um, will, be, will vary. And it, it has been proven also through several studies, analysis, territorial impact assessments and so on, that in fact, those regions that tend to profit from such trade agreements are the regions that are already richer, that are already more innovative, more diversified, and so on. So um, we have to have a voice of also those who are concerned increasingly. And in 2016, we had an escalation of such a concern when uh, the region of Wallonia simply did not trust uh, the set agreement and opted to reject it. sorry, unmute myself, we've established that um, uh, that actually there is a perspective to the EU's trade policy that at the time very few people realized, and that is that the subnational level, A, has a role in some countries in actually approving and ratifying if it's considered a mixed agreement. Uh, two, the trade is becoming a, a political uh, hot potato. Uh, because of the uh, impact and um, unequal, unequal impact at different levels of government and on different um, member states. So, okay, we've established therefore that from now on, 
and from already 2016 onwards, um, there's going to have to be much more of what we call in the Committee of the Regions a uh, multi-level uh, approach to this. That's, in other words, a dialogue between the different levels of government before trade negotiations can be completed. That adds a layer of complexity, of course. So let's, as we're uh, addressing students of European politics, let's address a little bit the mechanics of how this dialogue uh, has been taking place. So tell us a little bit about um, tell us a little bit about the the rapporteur, the person that we call rapporteur uh, in the Committee of the Regions. That is the person who's drafting uh, the report. Tell us a little bit about what the report that uh, it was that you worked on, what it was focusing on, and who the drafter was, who the rapporteur was. All right. So. Um, with this increased awareness of the relevance of trade of EU trade policy for local and regional level, obviously the, the Committee of the Regions also uh, included it under one of the competences of the ACON Commission, the, the Commission that deals with economic issues, more or less. Um, and we have done uh, in the past in um, um, territorial impact analysis on trade, uh, we have done opinions in the past uh, already. But uh, when the European Commission announced that the, uh, with this new mandate, uh, the Commission would do a comprehensive trade policy review, um, we discussed and we decided to appoint uh, a rapporteur on this already in advance. Uh, the Committee of the Region has different ways of responding to, to either legislation or communication of the, of the European Commission. In this case, we were anticipating a communication on a comprehensive uh, review of over the entire policy, which in itself does not necessarily have a direct um, legislative impact immediately, but announces what we need to change and how. And uh, we appointed, uh, we decided to appoint a rapporteur on this file already in June 2020. Um, for us, you know, trade has always been a, a, let's say, a strategic priority. We have argued for openness and for trade, but also for uh, responsible, in a way, negotiation with sometimes uh, partners that have different political cultures or completely different economies and so on. Um, so we are also, as liberals, always defending sustainable trade and, and, and reciprocity and and multilateralism, particularly in the framework of WTO. Um, when we saw that we have uh, in, amongst our members in ECON uh, a Wallonian minister for economy and trade, I think the the, the decision to 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 run with him to to propose him as the rapporteur was quite easy, and the other groups quickly realized that. We have a big joker because Wallonia has a bit of a notoriety in trade talks now in Brussels still, even though you know the main issues have then moved on to the to Atlantic to the transatlantic uh, trade dispute with Donald Trump and so on. So maybe it has been forgotten a little bit. But to remind everyone that if we're doing a comprehensive trade policy review, we don't want to get at the end of a very long, very difficult negotiation on very complex issues, uh, we don't want at the end the same situation as it was with Wallonia. So for us, it was very opportune and strategic in a way to be able to provide early input directly from one of the regions that has most concerns with these new uh, trade agreements um, and uh, from the region that, that, that already um, caused a bit, of a, yeah, a bit of an issue. Uh, Willy Boxu um, was, of course, uh, immediately interested, and when we appointed him, he started his work. Um, because of the, well, of the COVID-19 pandemic, let's say that the timeline stretched uh, itself a little bit. Uh, we also had the resignation of Commissioner Hogan, which then uh, delayed the whole process a little bit. But our decision to appoint early was also due to the fact that we wanted to provide input before the commission communication and ideally also respond with one opinion and this is sometimes tricky but we can still do it because we have two stage uh, two stage adoption we have the committee um, 
uh, we have a, uh, the adoption at the commission level, uh, which was in November, so before uh, February announcement, well, fe uh, February, um, well, announcement of the communication on trade policy review. And our adoption was uh, at the plenary level was scheduled for March so that we had, could with some amendments to respond to the trade policy review. Now, in terms of content, let, let me just stop you there just for a second, Andre, yeah. because I think um, yeah. something that's worth reminding, which may not be uh, obvious to, to everyone watching is, of course, the Committee of the Regions is a, is a political assembly and it is made up of politicians from the subnational level who are appointed by their national government uh, or nominated by their national government and appointed by the council of the eu and uh, you have all uh, different types of subnational government represented in the committee of the region so you can have a mayor of a small municipality and then you can have a uh, vice president of an important region like wallonia in the case of uh, Willy Borsu, who is the rapporteur here. And as a parliamentary assembly or as a political assembly, um, we of course function very much like a parliament with uh, committees, which we call commissions, one of them being the economic affairs one, the econ one where Willy Borsu uh, was sitting. I thought it was just um, uh, important to just clarify that because of course we, we take it for granted, but not everybody watching may have realized that. So um, carry on, Andre. Uh, yes, I think you were going to tell us about the, you were going to tell us about the the milestones that uh, yes. uh, after he became um, rapporteur, how the procedure evolved. Yeah, uh, so uh, after the adoption in, in November at the commission, uh, at the Econ Commission, we went to plenary in March. We had time to respond to the communication, which was published on 19 February. Uh, and the, the let's say the, the pinnacle of this process was when at the March plenary, uh, Commissioner Dombrovskis was there for this uh, debate and responded to the rapport directly. Um, in terms of content, uh, our rapporteur was, let's say, ideally placed also for, for, for the reason that he is a minister with a very broad portfolio. So he's not just minister for trade, Wallonia does not have an entire minister for trade, it has a ministry for the economy, it includes trade, um, but also uh, agriculture, um, tourism, spatial planning, and so on. So Minister Borsu, is, has a very uh, first-hand experience uh, from the ground level uh, of how these policies, how EU policies in these fields interact. And this is one of the main uh, points of this opinion. Um, we are still behind, fully behind EU trade openness and so on uh, as the institution, uh, but we want trade policy to be much better aligned with other EU policies, industrial policy, common agricultural policy, particularly cohesion policy, because we were talking about unequal effects of trade. If we, are, if we want to make regions more equal in terms of economic development, if we are investing uh, into less developed regions and then opening uh, uh, the whole EU internal market to trade that then can shift this balance back to more inequality, we have uh, opposing goals in a way. Uh, so better alignment, and then particularly this new green uh, the, the dimension, so alignment with the Green Deal across uh, the spectrum, which, I mean, now uh, it, it, we have a very, very, let's say, a concrete example, and the opinion also mentioned it, mentions it, the agreement with Mercosur. Uh, we know what we're talking about here. Um, we're talking about the Amazon forest. Um, how do we... Um, let's say force Brazil to to respect some commitments. Uh, what are the mechanisms here when we talk about sustainability clauses in trade? Uh, because we know that all trade agreements in the in, in the past couple of years have sustainability clauses, but how do we monitor? What's the governance and so on? So the the the, the opinion deals a lot with that. 
Um, obviously, one of the main points of, of the opinion is to include uh, local and regional governments at the early stage. And let's say that this opinion and the whole process was already an example of inclusion. Uh, in, in the whole process of what, what happens now, is uh, the European Parliament um, also adopted uh, a resolution to respond to this, this trade policy review. Um, the final the plenary adoption is still pending. Uh, the rapporteur was also Belgian. So we, we obviously uh, provided some early input into that and we saw that, that um, the, the draft of the parliament looks uh, rather good as well. And it's interesting that Minister Bussou now, now uh, wears several hats because at the same time he is negotiating inside Belgium, the Belgian position for the council, which has to be negotiated between the regions of, of Brussels and, 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 and Flanders as well. Uh, so he is influencing the EU policy through Belgian in, in internal position for the council. He's influencing it here through the opinion of the CR. He's influencing it on the ground as a minister who will have to, of a region that will eventually have to ratify a new agreement and so on. Um, so this is a perfect example of this multi-level uh, governance in, 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 in the works. So. Thanks for that. And I think um, we're, we've got a good picture now of why regions are involved in trade, how trade has become more complex for the European Union uh, over the years, and that the involvement of trade is in, a re in fact a, probably a response to the complexity of trade in a in a globalized world with with increasing uh, inequality. Now, um, just a final question: uh, You've alluded to it already. Obviously, the Committee of the Regions is a consultative body, um, but nevertheless is very much involved in the discussions. How would you say the the three main institutions, Commission, Parliament, and Council, have? interacted with the Committee of the Regions and specifically with the uh, Rapporteur, Minister Borsu, uh, throughout the process so far? Um, we, we got in touch with the Commissioner's Cabinet quite early and, uh, and again, uh, the, the first response was quite good, you know, that we had uh, also a bilateral almost scheduled with the former Commissioner Hogan. But then, uh, obviously, the, the change of the commissioner and this 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 being shifted to the vice president of the commission um, made it logistically less uh, just less likely that uh, we would get the meeting soon enough before the commission. Uh, so uh, we got the commissioner to the plenary. Uh, our input was noted already at the staff level before the 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 communication was drafted while it was being drafted and. And we have to say that some some uh, elements are there. Um, when the commissioner discussed with the rapporteur the plenary, um, the question was more about how concretely will we achieve these better, this better alignment of of let's say trade policy with cap and cohesion. So in concrete terms, we we are still we still need to work these policies out, and all the other policies will need to be. Uh, readjusted in a way. So this is now uh, basically a, a diligence uh, task of us. We need to monitor literally every new legislation that will uh, come that has to do anything with trade and, and at the same time all the trade legislation. The parliament is very responsive and has a lot of, uh, let's say, understanding for the COR on this issue because the parliament only recently got competence. So we are kind of on the same boat. We are, uh, and they, they obviously uh, uh, remember very well the, the 2016. So, um, so yeah, we also had uh, discussions within our political family uh, because Mr. Borsu is perhaps a little bit more um, on the side of, 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 of the worried, uh, um, I wouldn't say trade skeptics because we are clearly talking about um, openness uh, about uh, continuation of this multilateralism under the WTO, but um, let's be realistic about about uh, about the effects on particularly sustainability and and uh, the effect that trade has trade agreements have on on our farmers. 
uh, while you know that in the liberal family we also have uh, uh, very strong uh, defendants of trade and and within our, our group sometimes it isn't easy easy to talk about I, in the in the beginning all these debates can be very very uh, let's say passionate because they're also different member states have different interests but when it comes down to technicalities then you realize that that the complexity of these trade agreements also means that um, a lot of time there are safety uh, safety clauses already built in and for example if we talk about uh, import of brazilian meat the quotas will be relatively small so the impact is not as as big as those who 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 are arguing now against the agreement altogether um fear and also the timelines are are still i mean when you start the negotiation negotiate, negotiating a very complex trade agreement you're talking years if not decades so uh, some of these fears will be answered, and we still need to pursue trade. I mean, we closing the economies is not the answer, as we've just learned in the last year. Uh, we have troubles making vaccines, or have troubles uh, importing, exporting vaccines. For example, just one of the key, you know, um, goods of today. Uh, so, but how we revise the the, the entire EU trade policy in the future? It's going to be it's going to be for the next years, if not the entire mandate, um, and we will have to now follow how this trade policy review is actually worked out in in in, in detail. Yeah, and in fact, I think what's uh, come clear listening to you is that the trade perhaps has been perceived in the past as uh, very technical, uh, very technocratic. But in fact, what you just referred to now, here is uh, a minister from uh, uh, a political family, which is very pro-trade, who nevertheless has concerns. And that reminds me um, uh, of a comment that was made by another regional minister in, a re in, the, in the last plenary of the CUR, which in a way ties trade to the very essence of democracy. Uh, the, it was the vice president of the region of Castilla y León in Spain, Francisco Igea, who was uh, sounding out a warning against the increasing inequality between urban areas and rural areas. And he was saying, as if, if we continue uh, collectively to neglect the rural areas, to allow um, the urban uh, the urban areas, cities to really soar ahead in terms of uh, technology, economic development, etc., and the rural areas are are left behind. Then that massive disparity is going to have uh, dire consequences for our democracies. And trade plays a key role there, of course. Uh, so the 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 rural element, which you referred to earlier, and there is a strong rural element in the region of Wallonia, um, and the future of people who live in rural areas. Is, is something that um, across the political divide, um, politicians uh, with, with government responsibilities are fighting to ensure um, is, uh, does not become a, a serious problem for our democracies. So I think we'll leave it there. We've given, um, actually just, uh, we've only just scratched the surface, uh, but I think we've given a feel to, to those who are watching of uh, the com the new complexities in in the area of trade uh, for the European Union, and in particular also the the role that some national government has to play, and the role that the uh, rep the institution that represents some national government, that's Committee of the Regions, uh, has to play, has played, and will continue to play in the uh, near future. So, Andre, thank you very much, and to all of those watching, we hope you found it useful, and. Um, all the best.